Continuing ASCP's series sharing the behind-the-scenes work that medical laboratories are doing to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, we visit the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle. Seattle is the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in the United States. It has been astonishing to see the Herculean efforts of this lab team working tirelessly to get the needed assay up and running in order to take care of patients not just in Seattle, but around the nation. The dedication of our lab professionals and pathologists who have risen to the occasion unlike any other practitioners in healthcare is amazing. Hi, I'm Dr. Irvin Holliday, CEO of the American Society for Clinical Pathology, and it's an absolute pleasure to be able to sit down with a world-renowned toxicologist and the chair of laboratory medicine here at the University of Washington, a clinical pathologist, Dr. Jeffrey Baird. Dr. Baird, thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. You are literally at the epicenter of this pandemic. The nation is looking towards you and the University of Washington to help shepherd the appropriate causes, the appropriate therapy, but more importantly, the diagnostics. And the diagnostics are actually all we have. There is no therapy for these patients. At the first time this arose in your institution from today to today, what is your impression of the state of the state of coronavirus and COVID-19 testing? You, you mentioned that we're at the epicenter. I really think a better way of thinking about it is that we're at the forefront. Um, this is a wave and we happen to be the first affected uh, large urban center, but it's, it's, hap it's gonna happen everywhere. So it's not going to uh, only happen here most severely and then uh, be distributed out less you know, than the epicenter. I think it's just going to move through other places. So um, that's the first uh, thought I have. We were set up with, I think, the best possible team to do that. And, and what has been made absolutely apparent in this is that it, uh, tackling this from a diagnostic standpoint is a team effort. Uh, we happened to have been the site that had the first known case. We also became, I believe, the site that had the first death. Uh, but when the first known case came, we were still in a state where that testing needed to be sent uh, on to public health and the CDC, et cetera. So we still couldn't do that test. Um, when, you know, that's one of the critical functions that we perform in laboratory medicine is that we ensure that our tests actually work and give positive results when the patient has it and give negative results when they don't. Um, February 29th was a Saturday. The FDA made a rule that said that we could just begin testing and then apply for our emergency use authorization at some point in the future, but we could do 14 days of testing. And so that was February 29th. Sunday morning, uh, March 1st, we accepted samples and we ran our first run of about 100 tests on Monday morning. Um, we then ran 100 tests a day for a while and then ramped up and really saw over the last two weeks pure exponential growth in testing volume to the, the point where our volume capacity for testing right now is about 1,800 tests a day and it's not nearly enough. Uh, we were doing all the tests that were asked of us and really providing, I think, about, you know, sometimes less than 12 hour turnaround time, but 12 to 14 hour turnaround time for our community here at the University of Washington and also for the region. Uh, so we are a reference laboratory, um, which is part of the reason we've been successful in this is that we, as a reference laboratory, have the capacity, the staff, the faculty, the infrastructure, and to be frank, the money to invest in these uh, new types of tests. So we built our capacity rapidly, and this testing has rapidly overtaken uh, our virology laboratory, and now we're quite taxed. But we ramped up to the period where I believe there may have been a day or two when we were doing most of the testing in the United States, certainly more than all the public health uh, folks could do, simply because they're, the public health in the public health laboratories in our country are not resourced appropriately to respond to these things. While the rest of the country is lagging behind on their throughput and even bringing this assay online, you've been able to do it in an exponential fashion. How did you do it with the same personnel? How did you do it with the current staffing that you had? And were there any challenges or what did you notice about your laboratory team that may have allowed you to do this maybe as exponentially as you've done? The team is one thing. Um, we have amazing faculty, amazing staff. Uh, the people who are the hands who are doing this have been working sometimes 24 hours, usually 18 hours, seven days a week. We've also had all of the other laboratories. Remember, 
we, we run a very large reference laboratory that has a 2,000 test menu and we still need to do all of them because people still do get cancer and infectious diseases other than COVID and toxicologic emergencies and other things like that. So we have to do all that, but we've been able to uh, transfer some of those staff to support uh, the, the coronavirus testing effort too. So the, the team is really, the people who are involved is one thing. One is the infrastructure. We've been doing reference laboratory testing for the community and for the country uh, for almost 50 years. Our department started in 1969 with a financial model and a setup that allowed us to operate as a uh, outreach testing operation in an academic setting. An enormous amount of money this has cost. In two weeks I've spent I think considering the resources that I expended yesterday, uh, approximately $10 million. Um, and so if you think about $10 million and about 10,000 tests, so we're, we're getting at a cost of about $1,000 a test right now. Um, that's worth considering uh, for a couple reasons. One is that might explain why some places haven't ramped to 2,000 tests a day immediately because turning into essentially a commercial reference laboratory for a state uh, is not cheap or even feasible if you don't have the infrastructure team and money available. Um, it's also not sustainable, I would, I would add, and that's uh, really something that our government needs to uh, pay attention to. And actually, I would say um, the, my state government here is paying attention to that. And my leadership, my boss, my organization does understand the role that laboratory is paying, uh, playing. You mentioned that the thing that we have right now is laboratory testing. Yeah, we do not have a therapy. We do not have a vaccine. We have triage, supportive care, and testing. And so um, it isn't often, you know, uh, that laboratory testing comes to the, the forefront of, uh, of the consciousness of you know, our society. Uh, approximately 4% of our national healthcare spending goes towards laboratory testing. And that probably represents maybe you know, a, a relative you know, public perception of you know, maybe the importance or the primacy of what we're doing. And that's not at all the case, that we're far more important in that, and especially in a time like this, that um, I have a, a very outsized uh, responsibility compared to you know, uh, what we've normally uh, had in terms of visibility. Can you think of some lessons learned that if we were to help patients understand just the veracity of these scientists, the brilliance of these scientists, and the lessons learned that we can help them maybe be even more conscious and perhaps maybe even be more proactive in their own healthcare decision as it relates to their laboratory testing as well. There's a, there's a whole campaign out there called Choosing Wisely, you've probably heard of it, where we're trying to help educate patients to be more proactive in decision making about the kinds of laboratory tests they get. Now they're reliant on us, but if they learn more about us, are there lessons learned that we can pay forward to help patients understand just how critical the team is of laboratory scientists and pathologists in helping them make sure they maintain and shepherd their health care? Uh, I was very involved with Choosing Wisely since the very beginning of ASCP's inception of that and, and was very involved in actually helping write the first 10 recommendations and have been continually involved with that. So I really do appreciate the value of uh, Choosing Wisely and ASCP's role in it. I think it's very forward thinking. I, I wonder if maybe one of the things that we could do was provide some better guidance as to who really needs a test. Uh, but we do not have enough resources right now to test the populace of the United States, over 300 million folks, and we won't for a very long time. Tell me about your lab team and tell me a little bit about how you believe um, they have risen to the challenge and how proud you are, or maybe just just the capacity, uh, the science capacity and their ability to help you transform your own uh, practice and your own testing algorithms. And then how can we use that going forward to help people understand this is a phenomenal profession and one which you might love to get involved in. There's an enormous workforce that does all of the work that gets you the answers you need and people might not really appreciate that you know, that, that happened when they got their urinalysis or their pregnancy test or their cancer, you know, genome panel. There's a lot of people that are involved in getting this test result back to them that they really want. It's going to keep going for a long time and I hope all around the country people also realize that even if the resources are, are, are low and the supply chains collapse um, and maybe the testing that is needed can't be done, it's not for lack of trying. Uh, the laboratory staff, all the laboratory chairs that I talk to on our listservs, um, all of the staff, medical directors, 
medical laboratory scientists, supervisors, administrators, they all really, really want to help, and they will, uh, but we need to solve some problems uh, that allow them to have the tools and the resources they need to do that work. If you're really interested in why questions, you want to know why something happened, this is how we answer. This is the place that answers why. Why do things happen? What's going on? What is the actual cause of something? If you want to get the answer to something, that's what we do in pathology.